The biggest challenge when writing an app isn't writing code, but rather figuring out how to model data in a way that works at scale. If you don't put enough thought into it, your app could suffer from slow performance, data inconsistencies, and difficulties in adding new features. Not good. We have the old-school relational databases, which are still leading the space with a market share of 72%. They use tables and relationships to model data, which is great for most apps. However, when your data starts growing in size or complexity, it can become a bottleneck. That's when you might want to consider alternative data models like graph databases, which can handle complexity, or white column databases that can scale data at astonishing levels. Of course, with so many options available, it can be tough to know which one is the best fit for your project. But don't worry, we'll break down the different types of databases with their pros and cons so you can make a decision that works for you. So, let's start the journey to find the perfect database for your unique needs. Imagine we have large amounts of semi-structured data and we assign it a set of unique identifiers. We just created a collection of key-value pairs for fast access. So this model is flexible enough for unstructured data. This type of database implements a hash table to store unique keys along with the pointers to the corresponding data values. Since the data structure is basically an index, it's very fast and efficient for data retrieval. It uses a hash function to quickly calculate the location for storage based on the key. Then, it uses the same key to quickly locate the corresponding value in memory in constant time. Since the model is so simple and the dataset is rather small, these databases are often stored in memory. This makes data retrieval blazing fast, sometimes with sub-millisecond response time. Other data models, such as relational and document-based, are not as suited for in-memory storage. This is because they tend to have more complex data structures with fields and columns and also relationships, and that can require more memory and processing power to handle. But how much data can we store in memory? Since RAM is so fast, why don't we load all database types in memory? Some people may argue that today, we can store huge amounts of data in memory, and there are database clusters with zillions of nodes that keep data in memory. Let's consider that the cost is not a problem, although we should take a glance at it. First, we should consider that for mission-critical apps, we would need to persist data on disk as well, because in case of a crash, we would lose some or all the data. There are two main ways to synchronize the RAM with the disk but they both significantly affect the response time from nanoseconds to milliseconds. Second, no matter how fast the storage medium is, in the end, the size of the data will make the system slower. Why don't we store the entire database in the CPU cache memory? This is considered to be the fastest. First, because the cost will be very high. Second, because the size of the data determines how fast the data is retrieved. That's why, even the CPU cache memory has three layers. As a rule of thumb, if we want blazing fast responses for a set of data, the size should be relatively small. So, key takeaway number three is that key value databases are well suited to be stored in memory, which in turn provides faster responses. Finally, in this category, we can mention Memcached and Redis, although nowadays Redis offers the possibility of multimodal database. Simply put, key value stores are not designed for complex data structures. So, if you need to execute dynamic queries or perform complex aggregations based on multiple tables, then you should look at document or relational databases. Key value databases like Redis are designed for high performance and horizontal scalability rather than strong transactional consistency. Although Redis supports executing multiple commands as a single atomic transaction using the feature of multi-command transactions or using Lua scripting, it doesn't support the full ACID by default. It requires some tricks and configurations to reach the ACID properties and they usually come with trade-offs. And finally, key value stores are not well suited for data warehousing. 
This is because they are not designed to store large amounts of historical data, and they don't provide features such as data compression and indexing. Traditional SQL databases were designed for functionality rather than speed at scale, so a cache is often used to store the replies of costly queries from the relational database to reduce latency and significantly increase throughput. Caching is all about quickly accessing frequently used data and key value stores are perfectly designed to do just that. Key value stores are perfect for caching because they can quickly retrieve data using a unique key rather than searching through a large dataset. Also, key value stores allow for many data types as value, including linked lists and hash tables. Furthermore, they are stored in memory, which further increases the access speed. So, key value databases are optimized for high performance and low latency applications. However, this data model might be too simple for other use cases. So, we move on to the next data model in terms of complexity. Key value stores are fun and simple. Next, with white column stores, things start to get interesting. These databases store data in column families. Although they look similar to the tables in a relational database, they are not actually tables. We'll realize this when we try to make a query on a random attribute and we won't be able to do it. This is because we can search only by using the primary key similar to the key value stores. So, this model is not optimized for analytical queries that requires filtering across multiple columns, tables, joins, or aggregations. Speaking of the primary key, this is one of the most important concepts of white column databases. A primary key consists of one or more partition keys and zero or more clustering keys, sometimes called sort keys. For instance, in Cassandra, each dataset is partitioned by a partition key, which is a combination of one or more columns. Basically, we have a tool integrated in our data model to split the dataset and distribute it on multiple nodes. We'll see that wide columns databases are highly partitionable and allow for horizontal scaling at a magnitude that other types of databases cannot achieve. So, here, the partition key is used to distribute data on multiple partitions or nodes and the clustering key is used to sort data within a partition. So, a key takeaway here is that white columns databases are highly partitionable. White columns databases are storing data in denormalized form. This means that all data related to a particular item is stored together in a single row rather than being spread out across multiple tables. This allows for faster data retrieval and easier querying. You don't have to flip back and forth between multiple tables and do joins to get all the information you need. All information is in one place. However, this will be at the cost of potentially having some duplicates. And duplicating data is the root of all data inconsistencies among other problems we'll see next. So the key takeaway here is that white columns databases are storing data in denormalized form. Trying to find a row for a random attribute, it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack, but instead of a needle, you're looking for a specific piece of data, and instead of a haystack, you're looking on the entire cluster that can have hundreds of nodes. You probably know that scanning a full table can be a really slow process. Now imagine that you have to scan hundreds of tables to find a piece of data. Here, to avoid this problem, we'll make use of the category attribute as a partition key. This means that if you know that you're going to need to search by a specific attribute, you'll have to model the data in a way that puts that attribute as a partition key. Basically, you will partition all data based on that attribute. But what if you need to filter data by multiple individual attributes? Then, you'll have to create a new table for each query pattern. This can create a lot of duplicated data in addition to the denormalization duplication. But that's okay, because wide columns databases are really fast for writes. Jokes aside, if you need to do a lot of filtering or analytic queries, white column stores are not the best option. For transaction processing, consistency is key. 
However, by default, white columns databases are eventually consistent. This means that the data will be eventually consistent across all the nodes in the cluster and it doesn't guarantee that all nodes will be consistent at the same time. It's normally much more expensive in terms of latency and availability to work with transactions in such an environment. That's why white columns databases such as Cassandra offer the option of lightweight transactions. However, these are still quite expensive in multi-node environments where multiple round trips are necessary between the coordinator and the other nodes. So, white columns DBs are not the best option for ACID transactions. Adding new nodes to a Cassandra cluster is as simple as adding new blocks of Legos, and it's the same for removal. Data partitioning is embedded into the data model, which means it can be easily distributed across multiple nodes in the cluster. This makes horizontal scaling a breeze. But what happens with the existing data when a new node is added? Is the whole data redistributed in order to maintain an even distribution of data? Not really, because that would be way too costly. Cassandra uses the concept of consistent hashing and virtual nodes to minimize the amount of data that needs to be moved around the cluster. This algorithm also ensures that the data is evenly distributed across all nodes. We have a separate video on consistent hashing and virtual nodes, so please check it if you want to find out more. So, if adding a node is so simple, we can scale horizontally as much as we want. In fact, it has been reported that Apple are using 1000 Cassandra clusters with 300,000 nodes and storing 100 petabytes of data for multiple use cases such as iCloud and Siri. So, White Column's superpower is horizontal scalability. White Column's databases are considered to be good for writes for two main reasons. First, it uses a write-optimized storage architecture, which allows it to handle a huge number of writes very quickly. For instance, Cassandra uses a technique called log-structured storage, which allows it to write data on disk in large sequential blocks. Because of this principle, it doesn't have to spend time to look where the data is stored in real time. It will deal with it later in batches. Reason number two for fast writes is because of its partitioned architecture, which allows for writes to be executed in parallel on multiple nodes at the same time. Instead of spreading data across multiple tables and then join them back together like in a scavenger hunt, a document database puts all the information related to an entity in a single document. A document database is the classic example of denormalization. Using something like MongoDB, it's like giving your data a break from all the strict rules and regulation of a traditional relational database. Instead of splitting data into multiple tables and establishing relationships between them, you just store all related information within a single document. This is truly a more convenient way to handle data, but sometimes this may lead to some duplication of data. And if data duplication gets out of hand, you'll enter into the hell of data inconsistencies, where if one copy of the data is updated, it may not be updated in other copies, leading to conflicts and inconsistent information. Data duplication can lead to all sorts of problems in a chain. So, you just need to be careful to choose the right use case for the document database. If you have a lot of relations between different entities, then document DB might not be the best choice. The ability to store data in any format allows for fast prototyping and it eliminates the need to spend time on defining the schema and creating tables. So this speeds up development. However, without proper constraints, it can be difficult to maintain consistency in data across different documents. And this can limit the types of queries that we can perform on the data. Therefore, for more complex use cases, you would still need to think carefully about how you want to model your data and ensure that you have the appropriate indexes and constraints in place. Document databases often have more advanced indexing capabilities. They support secondary indexes with the following types, simple, compound, geospatial, unique, or full text indexing. So, make sure to index your data correctly and understand the performance implications of different types of indexes. Without proper indexes, MongoDB can have poor performance, especially when working with large sets of data. With indexes, it's easier to optimize queries and improve performance. 
This will allow you to perform complex queries on huge amounts of data like no other data model. If you need to handle a lot of complex relationships, a document database may not be the best choice. In fact, document databases such as MongoDB recommend embedding documents instead of using one-to-many or one-to-one -one relationships. This is the general rule unless there is a compelling reason not to do so. But you can actually model some relations in a document database, but you will not have the same level of features and integrity. Second, joining data from multiple tables can be a resource-intensive operation. This can slow down query performance, and this is where relational databases sometimes struggle. As the size of the data grows, join operations become more and more expensive. Now, in a document database like Mongo, which is highly scalable, this could mean a significant performance impact on the entire database system. Furthermore, maintaining data consistencies between related entities can be a difficult task in document database. This is because there is no enforced referential integrity and changes to one document may not be reflected in others related documents. A document-oriented database is the perfect match for object-oriented programming. One side can express the model in its natural language, usually an object that can be represented as a JSON, and the other side can understand it without any translation. This is not the case with object-oriented programming and relational databases. For decades, it has been attempted to close the gap with different frameworks and tricks, but they just don't mix so well. So, Document databases are easy to scale, they provide indexing, powerful ad hoc queries and analytics, and they also have some features for transactional support. Relational databases have been the dominant choice for data storage for decades and their popularity only continues to grow. Despite the rise of alternative databases such as NoSQL, relational databases remain a staple in many industries, especially in finance and e-commerce. There are several reasons for their continuous dominance. First, all data in most applications is relational. Customers make orders, orders contain products, and products are found in stores and so on. Furthermore, the relational model with its tables, rows and columns provide a clear and straightforward way to model the data, making it easy for developers to work with. Before making use of relational databases, you need to model your data according to the strict rules of normalization. Or you can just roll on your intuition and you might learn the hard way why some things need to be done in a certain way. Normalization is the process of organizing data in separate tables. It's like organizing your closet, and just as you might separate your shirts from your pants, normalization involves breaking up data into smaller, more manageable pieces. These rules help to prevent clutter and duplication and improve data integrity. But what does data integrity mean? Just like a tidy room gives you peace of mind that everything is in place, data integrity gives you peace of mind that your data is consistent, accurate, and not damaged or lost. This sounds easy to achieve until you have hundreds of concurrent transactions with a lot of cash involved. Scaling horizontally a relational database can be a difficult task to achieve. Although there are solutions for scaling a relational database, such as replication and sharding, they usually require a significant added complexity, both in terms of infrastructure and administration. To be able to scale a database, you need to partition it. However, relational databases rely on relationships between tables, and partitioning the data can break these relations, making it difficult to ensure data consistency and integrity. So, if you need to store large amounts of data, especially less structured data, then a NoSQL database might be more suitable. When it comes to transactional processing, relational databases are the best in town. A big part of their success can be attributed to their well-established ACID guarantees. We have atomicity, consistency, isolation and durability, and these four ensure the reliability and integrity of stored data. 
while other database models also support the ACID properties for transactions, relational databases are still considered the best option. This is because the structures of tables and relationships makes it easier to enforce consistency and maintain data integrity, which is critical for transactions. In particular cases, other database models may struggle to comply to all ACID properties. For instance, ensuring consistency and isolation can be difficult because multiple transactions may be executed concurrently. Now, if we consider a distributed system like a white column database with many nodes, it can be even more challenging to ensure that each transaction has a consistent view of the data. And things get more complex when network connections might fail or one node might successfully complete its part of the transaction and then be required to roll back its changes because a failure occurred on another node. However, the trade-off for strong consistency is not being able to scale as much or as easy. In a graph database, data is stored as a connected graph. The nodes in the graph represent entities such as tweets, users, tags, and the edges represent the relationships between these entities such as follows or mention. Let's say we want to get the top 10 tags used in all messages by a certain user. In a relational database, we would have to do a join between the tags and the tweets tables, which will basically result in a separate table. However, in graph stores, relationships between nodes are stored directly on the nodes rather than separate tables. Because of this principle, graph databases don't need to compute the relationships between data at query time. The connections are already there, stored on the nodes. Because of this, queries with densely connected data are orders of magnitude faster. Graph databases eliminate the need for expensive join operations, making data maintenance a breeze. This model is powerful enough to cover the most complex data structures. For instance, Neo4j was used to build a knowledge graph at NASA. However, to properly manage and maintain a graph database, it requires a certain level of expertise. Unlike other types of databases, GraphDBs can be challenging to learn and manage, especially when dealing with large, intricate graphs. So, be prepared to invest some time and effort for getting up to speed. Now, graph databases are pretty difficult to model on a single node, but what happens when you need to distribute the graph on multiple nodes? Well, you'll just need to consider a lot of stuff, such as how to distribute the edges across the nodes or how to balance the graph data evenly. And if these are not hard problems, then what if some node is failing or what about dynamic node addition or removal? And the list goes on. While graph databases are optimized for traversing and querying relationships, they may not be the best choice for write-heavy workloads. In order to support a high volume of writes, you need to write to multiple nodes in parallel. However, the overhead of maintaining the graph structure connected across nodes will slow down the scaling pretty quickly and therefore the write throughput. And there is also a high risk of data inconsistency and conflicts. Other models, such as key value, or white columns are much more suitable for write-heavy loads. Graph databases can become quite large and unmanageable, especially when dealing with complex relationships. So be prepared to invest in some serious hardware resources if you want to use a graph database. The performance benefits of a graph database become more pronounced when dealing with complex multi-hub relationship between entities. For example, in a data center scenario, it may be necessary to traverse several relationships to find all the switches of a particular data center, and then another hub to find all the interfaces of that data center. In a graph database, this can be achieved in a single traversal, making the query much faster and more efficient. In contrast, relational databases typically store relationships between entities as foreign keys in separate tables, requiring expensive join operation to traverse the relationships between entities. This can result in slow and complex queries, particularly when dealing with densely connected data.